you would, I want you to open your Bible to the Gospel of Luke. As a matter of fact, if you'll find a couple places, find the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel, I mean the, the book of Isaiah, that's in the Old Testament in the middle of your Bible. Find those two openings to start with, Luke chapter 11. Again, if you find the index, it's easy and you can quickly turn to these different books. If you find the index, it will just tell you what page to go to. Isaiah chapter 22 and Luke chapter 11. Isaiah and Luke, and I'm going to start out with Luke, and I mentioned this last week uh, about the, uh, the four Gospels. Have you ever asked yourself why were there just four Gospels? Because there were a lot of Gospels written early on. I mean, you know, the Gospel of Thomas, that's a powerful yeah. book if you ever... If you buy the lost scriptures, the Gospel of Thomas is, is really powerful. It's not a very big gospel. It's, uh, I think, 20 chapters or something like that. But the Gospel of Thomas, and there are a lot of Gospels. There's the Gospel of Peter. Uh, I forget the names of all of them, but there are, there are a lot of different Gospels. But they chose the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did you know that? Did you ever ask why? The reason they did that, I'll show you why they did that real quickly. Uh, uh, this is this circle represents the circle is represents God or the Alif or Elohim, the eternal one, mm -hmm. the nameless one, the timeless one, mm -hmm. the unknowable one. <laughs> <laughs> all of those different names because there's nowhere to really begin but so that we as humans can find the beginning place the circle represents the Milky Way galaxy we can associate with the whole Milky Way galaxy okay and yet in our from our earth our zodiac is made up of 12 different signs and uh, it has a cross in the middle of it, and that's where the symbol of the cross comes from. Okay? The, symbol, the cross is a symbol of man being built by the universe, the astrological wheels. That's, what, that's basically what it means, that's what it says. And it's divided into four quadrants. That's where you get the four Gospels. So you have Mark is the Gospel of the servant, you study the book of Mark, which is actually the oldest. You know, if you try to put them in chronological order, Mark would be the oldest, and it would be the book uh, of these this first quarter right here. And so this one, this is this is fire, F I R E. This is earth, E A R T H. Uh, air. A R and water. And so those four gospels, the subject of them, like Luke's gospel is the is a water gospel, so the, the gospel of Luke is about the Son of Man. That's the whole the theme of that. It's an it's astrological. All of it is astrological. Everything in the Bible is astrological and based in astrology. And we don't know that because we have been told that astrologers were mostly of the devil. That's what we were told. Well, you can take an Old Testament passage and that's what we said. And the reason they said that was because there was an astrologer who was hoodwinking the people and an astrologer and an astrology aren't the same thing. An astrologer would be one who communicates astrology. 
astrology is all through scripture. It's mentioned everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And so what I want you to see here, the Gospel of Luke is, is, uh, is the Gospel of, uh, of the Son of Man. That's what the theme of it is. And, and that's why it's here in this Aquarius. That's what Aquarius is. Is the man carrying the pitcher of water. That's what the book is about. And then in that, you, uh, uh, you have Pisces, the two fishes, which gives birth to the, the story of the name Jesus comes from, the, the Latin for fish. That's what Jesus' name means. It's Latin for fish. That's why you know that's that's why those associations are the way they are when you think about different things. When mm -hmm. Jesus said, "I'll make you fishers of men," mm -hmm. and so that. So the Gospel of Luke, if you can find that, you can find that. Turn over there with me to Luke chapter eleven, and this is a. Uh, this is an important passage of scripture, and I want to talk about it a lot because if you if you start to understand, if we start to understand this astrological wheel and our association with it and in it because it is called the macrocosm or the the big the big man and we're called the microcosm the little man so the big man is God's creation and the little man is God's creation through you and me and so we're not powerless, we're powerful. Mm -hmm. But we don't know that. And we don't pay attention to that. And nobody has really taught us that. And so we live as though we're powerless. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, and I say this a lot. My grandfather was one of my mentors. And Grandpa, taught, he said, I'd rather hear you cussing to say I can't. Don't you ever tell me you can't. You know, because I told him one time when I was about 9 or 10 year old. And I couldn't reach the pedal in the old truck and grandpa said take that truck and pull that hay wagon to the barn i said i can't boy he come down on me don't you ever tell me you can't you get in there and you do that <laughs> so, so i did you can do whatever you want to do you don't say you can't but we're filled with i can't we do we say it all the time and we don't pay attention to our words we don't recognize or realize words are seeds god's word is a seed God's Word is the eternal seed. Our words, and most all of our words, are perishable seeds. Mm -hmm. And thank God they don't always come to pass. Aren't you glad? Because <laughs> we'd be in lots of trouble if they all came to pass. We scatter them out, and you know, that's where the whole principle, 30, 60, 90, comes about. So here we go. Luke chapter 11 and verse 52. We talked about this some last week in closing at the end. And uh, this is the chapter, the woe chapter. Woe. And notice what he says in verse 52. Woe unto you lawyers. For you, and when he's referring to the lawyers, he's actually referring to the prophets, the priests, the scribes, mm -hmm. the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Those are the men and women who gave us the scripture. Okay? And then they confused it. And the Catholic Church really were strong on this for almost uh, 1,300 years. They were until Wittenberg invented the printing press. The Catholics said, "Y'all ain't got no business even trying to read the Bible." Mm -hmm. And y'all may be some of you like me, old enough to remember that that used to be a common phrase that you, you don't have any need to have a Bible. You don't need to know what it says. I'll tell you what it says. Yeah, we in a lot of trouble <laughs> when that's the case. Because they can tell you anything they want to, just like it says right here. Woe unto you lawyers. I'd say preachers, mm -hmm. teachers, prophets, apostles, mm -hmm. people who try to tell you what the Bible's saying, like I'm trying to do. <laughs> Woe unto me. Don't take it for what I say it is. Check it out for yourself. You know, it's like, try me, prove me to see if I'm a workman who need not be embarrassed, but I've rightly divided the word of truth. Check me out. I don't mind that. I, I welcome that. Because if I'm in error and you can point that out for me, I'll correct it. Mm -hmm. But no, it says, Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. 
Whoa, now you have to think about that. If the key of knowledge has been taken away from me, what is that key and what would I do with it if I had that key? I'm going to tell you what you would do with it. You would open the door to your own self and see what you are. And see and recognize that maybe you are a lot more than the lawyers have told you that you are. So notice what it says again. I, I want you to see this. Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourself, and them that were entering you hindered. Mm -hmm. Selah, that is... Pause and think about that. that mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah. that's profound and scary at the same time, and it's happened to mm -hmm. all of us. Now, mm -hmm. go over with me now to Luke. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 22. And everybody found it? Isaiah chapter 22. And you can follow me with this. Verse 20, Isaiah 22, verse 20, and it says, And it will come to pass that in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. He said, In that day I will, it will come to pass, this is what he said, it will. It will come to pass mm -hmm. that in that day, I wonder when that day is. I wonder if that day could be this day. Mm -hmm. I would say, Yes, this is that day. If I had the key, and I was going to open this door, and I am, I would say that's this day. And then I would have to know, if I recognize that that is this day, who is Eliakim? Mm -hmm. I will call my servant Eliakim. Now, does that mean that God's going to call you Eliakim if you're God's servant? Because if you study the book of Mark, you will realize the book of Mark is the Taurus, which is this fireside, and Taurus is the servant of mankind. That's what, a, that's what a bull is for. A bull is to serve mankind. In other words, well, use the bull. Like they use the bull back then, harness it up, plow the earth. That's what they're for. You know, they didn't necessarily eat the bull. They eat the cow, but they, they didn't eat the bull. They used the bull for work because it was a servant. And the book of Mark is about that. The entire book of Mark is set up in the 12 different signs of the astrological wheel and when in the book of Mark Jesus is picking out his 12 apostles every one of their names goes in one of the astrological wheels mm. every one of them and so we haven't been taught that why they took that key away from us mm -hmm. they did not want you to know that because if you start to know that then it changes things so who is Eliakim if you look up his name it just simply means God has established and if you come to realize and you come to recognize God has established you. And if you recognize that and you realize that, then you will realize that I have the will. Everybody say will. will. How many of y'all got a will? Got one. Sometimes you lose it. <laughs> you ever lost your will? Oh, yeah. You try to do something don't, and can't will to do it? Mm -hmm. Want to do it? But can't. Mm -hmm. Want to? But can't. Why? Because your will, somehow or another, you've lost your will or your will's weak. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of that? Weak will? Mm -hmm. Weak minded? Yeah. Well, that's not true. That's a lie. You have the will if you would just exercise it and use it. It's just exactly like intuition. You have intuition. It's the sixth gift of the Spirit or it's the sixth sense of the Spirit. You've been told that you just have five. You have five outward. You have two inward to give you a total of seven senses. And one of your senses is intuition. Mm -hmm. And it's powerful because intuition taps deeply into your will. And when you can intuit something, I promise you, you can will it. Mm -hmm. And if you will it, you'll begin to realize mm -hmm. that you are operating in the servant, Eliakim, 
and you will realize that God has established your will for purpose and design. And it's much stronger than you think it is. Because many times you don't realize, many times we don't realize and we recognize that we will against ourselves. Especially when we start to say, I can't. So notice again, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And the word Hilkiah actually means your portion. Now, you see all of these names, you say, well, these were just figures. No, they weren't. These were mythological characters that were purposefully put in the middle of this story that have a great intent and content. You have, and you have to weed through that and learn. I remember I tell this story quite often. Dr. Fuchsia Pickett was one of my mentors. She was one of my favorite teachers. And she told me years and years ago, she said, Lynn, if you never understand names and numbers, you'll never understand the Bible because it's a name and number book. And I come to realize that all the names in the Scripture have meaning. And if I don't understand, just like... When you start out in Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, you can start out with one chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's the building of the physical body, which is the temple of God. Mm -hmm. And then in chapters 4 and 5, it's the establishment of the spirit, the soul, and the body, the triune being. As mm -hmm. God is triune, light, life, and love, you are a reflection of that triune, even so you are triune spirit, soul, and body. And that spirit, soul, and body is the same thing as light, life, and love because you are a reflection of the microcosm as the microcosm. Mm -hmm. So in other words, as God is the big universe, you are the little universe. Mm -hmm. Every bit of this is hand in glove. Every bit. And so when you go back, I did like Dr. Pickett, I began to get a book or books that would tell me what different names mean. So when you go through Genesis 1, 2, and 3, that's the establishment of the physical body, God's temple, God's house, God's building that God lives in. Then when you get to chapter 4 and 5, you come to three boys. Right? What is the Trinity? It's three. Spirit, soul, and body. You come to three boys. What were their names? Cain, Abel, and Seth. Spirit, soul, and body. And you will find that Cain and Abel is always uh, your mind, and your body are always struggling with each other. One of them's mm -hmm. trying to kill the other. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing? Mm -hmm. Yes. One of your mind or your body are fighting <coughs> each other. Your body mm -hmm. saying, "I won't, I won't," and your mind saying, "You can't, you can't, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't." And you don't need to pay attention to either one of them until you train them. Mm -hmm. They're like children. I tell people, I said, the ego's the greatest thing God ever gave you because if God didn't give you an ego, then you wouldn't have any senses. You definitely not have any sense. <laughs> <laughs> you be a lot of trouble with no sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. So God gave you those senses, mm -hmm. and five of them on the outside, four of them stuck in your head. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and your ears. There's four of them. Where's the other one? It's your feelings. Mm -hmm. It's your whole body. It's on the outside. Well, what did God stick in your heart in the core of your being? He stepped, he stepped intuition and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use them, those are things that are within you. Mm -hmm. You know from, the, from your gut, from your, in, your inside. Intuition comes from your gut, from your inside. Those are divine gifts that God gave you. And, and a little child, most of us are little children that never really grew up. And, and that's so because we get stuck in our sexual apparatus and we don't grow up, we don't get... So that's our ego. You don't want to get rid of your ego. You want to cultivate it and develop it. Your ego comes from the divine ego, to the big E. That's God. So, here we go. Look at this, verse 21. I will clothe him with the robe, and that would be, that would be you or me. I will clothe you with the robe, and strengthen you with, with, with your girdle. And I will command the government. Everybody watch this. I will command the government. That's the order. That's the, uh, that's the thing. That's, that's the power of rule. 
You follow that? Mm -hmm. You have the power of rule over your own universe. You do. And so you rule your universe, or your universe rules you. Mm -hmm. And you know that it does. Yes. You know good well it does. And that's what that word government means. It just simply means rule or power. It's Misham law in Hebrew. Misham law, it's government. And I will command the government into his hands. It's in your hands. And he will be a father of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the city of peace, and to the house of Judah. That's the house of praise and worship. So you are the Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Not going to look for it. You are the Jeru, Salem, the city of peace mm -hmm. that God built for God's purpose. Right. And you are the one that worships. That's what Judah means, worship. Mm -hmm. You're the one that worships. Verse 22, and the key, what's the key for? The key's for the government. Without the key, the government can't function. In other words, the government represents the power and the rule. If you don't have the key, then they have neutered you of your power to rule. Mm -hmm. And just exactly like Luke said, they have taken away your keys. Mm -hmm. Have you ever lost your keys? <laughs> Everybody's lost your keys, hey. You say, oh my God, I can't, cry. I can't start my car. Why? I lost my keys. Oh, I can't get in my house. Why? I lost my keys. I'm talking to me. <laughs> I've done that many times before. Well, you've, been, you've lost your keys to your spiritual government, to your spiritual will, to your spiritual power to rule, not me, not the devil, not all that out there, yourself. You have to look in the mirror and you got to realize it's all about you. Mm -hmm. Every bit of it. It's all about you. And if you don't know it, and if you don't know what to do about it, guess what? It will rule over you. Mm -hmm. Or somebody else will. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's the biggest thing that we're fighting about right now in our government and in this nation is to come to that place that we are autonomous. We are individuals. And we are built and we are meant by God to be self-controlled, not controlled by the government. Mm -hmm. We are supposed to be the government. Mm -hmm. We are to be the ruler, mm -hmm. not to be ruled. And you don't like it when you... You ever have somebody tell you, you know, you can't. Mm -hmm. You don't like that. Mm -hmm. Even when you're a child. Children rebel against that. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because they have a... They have a intuitive nature that says I'm not supposed to be governed. And you're not supposed to. I know you know, I was raised in a very strict house that they ruled with a rod of iron. That's how they ruled with a rod. That's not the best way to rule. If you can't rule with love and teaching, a rod of iron could be dangerous. It can produce a lot of harm and a lot of hurt and a lot of rebellion. And a lot of people are hurt and harmed by that kind of rule. Amen. Amen. Verse 22, the key of the house of David, David being the apple of God's eye, that's what the story of David, and show, it shows very clearly the lifestyle of David was not that of righteousness, mm -hmm. but he was called righteous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anytime that you put one of your commanders, one of your front men in the army, out on the front lines with the, with the purpose and design to have that man killed because you want his young pretty wife. Mm -hmm. Actually, it even goes deeper than that. He's got that front man out there on the lines and he's already had sex with his young pretty wife and got her pregnant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and they don't nobody know it. But he knows it and she knows it. Uh-oh, uh-oh, we called red-headed. We gotta do something about that. And then, so David's trying to do something about it. So he called the commander-in-chief said, Tell him to come home, give him a, a, a week furlough so he can come home and get his wife pregnant. Mm -hmm. And this man was such a, a devote, devoted man, warrior, he said, no, I won't do that. I won't come home. I'm out here with the rest of my men on this line, and I'll stay here. Yes, I won't see my wife, but no, I'll stay out here and fight. So mm -hmm. they said, oh my God, I've got to change plans. So the best thing I can do right now is I'm going to put him on the front lines and get him killed. Mm -hmm. Then I'll marry her. And you guess, hey, that's God's apple eye. You know, God loves this man. 
I mean, you got to think about, you think that that's real? You think those stories really happened and that's the kind of a person? Do you want that kind of a leader? We had that for four, eight years, Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of trouble saying that one. <laughs> but I mean, he did, and he didn't really hide about it. He, did. he just said, I didn't have intercourse with that woman. Mm -hmm. Anyway. If we don't go back and study these these phenomenal stories, you know, it's like I'm telling y'all, I said, y'all really believe that Jack climbed that beanstalk and went and talked up? You don't believe that story, do you? Do you really believe that David or anybody would do what I just said? That they, and you go back and you read the story and you see what I said is exactly how the story played out. That's exactly how the story played out. So you have to realize what's God showing. He's showing you how human you really are. And it's not wrong. It's not right. It's not good. It's not evil. It just is what it is. And God gave it to you as a phenomenal gift. Said, now you train it and grow it up. Mm -hmm. That's your part. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to do that. It's going to require me to do something. Yep, it's going to require <laughs> you to say no when you need to say no. Right. And yes when you need to say yes. Mm -hmm. And many times, if not most of the time, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. hmm. So look at this. So he said, I give the key of the house, that's the government, that's the front door, that's the car. Mm -hmm. I give the key of the house of David and I will lay upon his shoulders and I, the, that's the government, that's what he's going to do. And he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. So God's simply saying, I've given you the power and the ability to shut it up or to open it up, whichever one you choose, whichever one you see and whichever one you think is right for you. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, you know, that's strictly up to you. Now I want you to go with me to the book of Galatians over in the New Testament now. And this gets kind of graphic over here. Let's see. Galatians chapter 4. You remember here several weeks ago we talked about this in Galatians. Again, if you get, if you get your index and just turn it and take what page, go, I'm going to go to Galatians. I'm going to go to Hebrews. Uh, we're going to jump all over the Bible this morning. Galatians chapter 4. say that the heir, as long as he is a child, you see that word child? Yes. As, long as, he, as long as he is a child, technon, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a child that can't talk. Mm -hmm. So you would actually say that he's still nursing at the breast. Now he uses a lot of different words here with this uh, you have to remember if you have been given if you're the heir and you've been given the rule of the government and you're still nursing, even though you're the heir, you need to be under teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Until you can become an adult and have the and have the knowledge to rule, correct? Mm -hmm. And that we was talking about that book that earlier before we started. And that book really opened the eyes of people to realize that if you give a teenager the keys to something that he don't need to have, he can be very dangerous. He can hurt himself as well as somebody else. And that's just that's just simple, simple common sense. We don't realize that these words are used in like potion. That means they're still being potty trained. That but it's always they use this word child or son. And we say, well, if he's talking about a son, he's just talking about a boy. No, that's the, that's the incorrect word. It should have been a child. Because a child can be a boy or a girl and still a child, still an heir. An heir. 
Like for instance, I didn't have sons. I had three daughters. All three of my daughters are heirs of mine. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they didn't have to be a son to be an heir and receive what I have. Right. They're a child. Mm -hmm. They're part of my project. And so they are legally, uh, gain, they gain the estate of whatever I have. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. So, and we get confused with these terms and with the scriptures because they'll use son all the time. Usually, when they, the Hebrew word bar or ben, B -E -N, or B-A-R, should have always been translated to child because it always means a boy or a girl. Mm -hmm. So if you're first born, it's not a boy, it's a girl, it's still the heir. And we have to get that correct because we have tried to put women, because of religion, we tried to put women in the kitchen mm -hmm. and in the house with a broom in their hand mm -hmm. and pregnant with a big belly and that's all they need to do. And that's just not true. Many times women can be more spiritual than men. Mm -hmm. And again, so those are things that, that religion has done to us and done against us. And many times we don't recognize it. We don't even pay attention to it and don't know it. And that, this, that's this really sad that it happens that way. So how many of you would like to change? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Everybody, ain't nobody. How many ever tried to change? Everybody. Did. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some changes. Yeah. Well, if you do not have the key to open the door to see why or what's going on that you can or cannot make change, mm -hmm. then you're, you you <coughs> spin your wheels, and we all do. <coughs> we all continually do that. You know, it's just like going on a three-day fast. You go on a three-day three day fast. You're fixing to put your body in a place where it's going to tell you exactly who it is and, and what it wants. <laughs> I'm going to tell you real quick, and it'll tell you real quick who's in control, and it'll tell you you're not. <laughs> your body's, ah, I'm the, I'm the one. You better feed me. I want something to eat right now. Some fried chicken, some something to eat, some beans and cornbread. And you said, no, you ain't going to eat for three days. What do you think will happen? It will pitch a fit. Mm -hmm. Then it'll, it'll say, oh my God, you're going to have a headache. You've got to eat something. You're going to die. Mm -hmm. I told somebody that's going on a seven-day fat. They said, oh, that'll, they'll kill you. You can't, you can't do that. You'll, you'll starve to death. You'll die. Mm -hmm. I said, no, you won't. <laughs> no, nobody die if you do it without food for seven days. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You'll just come out a few pounds lighter and a whole lot better. <laughs> But no, I mean, you know, see what I'm trying to say? I'm just trying to say you've got to get clear who's in charge of what. Mm -hmm. And that's one of our great problems. The only reason we come to this gathering is to learn, mostly mm -hmm. to learn who we really are and mm -hmm. what we really have. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know who we are, it really don't matter what you have. Sure. Because sure. whatever you got, mm -hmm. it's got you. Right. You ain't got it. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose of this is to get the thing reversed so that we can realize and we can recognize, I got this. Mm -hmm. And realize that the I, I got that is the spiritual you, the giant you, the more powerful you that's inside you that's ready to just jump up and take charge. Mm -hmm. But we have, to, we have to permit that. So Paul makes this thing real clear here. Verse 1, I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, and again, this word in the Greek, it has to do with uh, not talking, nephios. You have a nephios, and that's the Greek word, and it just simply means non-speaking or nursing baby. And that's clear. Anybody should, I mean, if they would have wrote that like that, it wouldn't have been any problem whatsoever for you to read this and get more clarity out of it. But if they take that word child and they use the English word child all through this, to you, it don't matter if you're 75 year old, I'm still the child of Rachel and James Hayes. Mm -hmm. 75 year old. But they have a different Greek word that clearly defines where you are in your walk. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, really? I didn't know that. I know it. <laughs> I didn't either <laughs> until I got to looking and studying. I thought, wow, why do they use so many different Greek words for our one English word, son? And yet it can refer to a woman. And yet it can refer to a different stage or place or position in your life. And when I started finding that out, I thought, wow, some of these passages make more sense when you begin to realize what they're really saying. That if we look at them through the glasses of the religion that every one of us have been taught, and, we, and we'll come back, well, it was good enough for mama, and it's good enough for grandmama, and it's good enough for great grandma, and it's good enough for me. Give me that old That's exactly how we get it. That's what we think. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so if you're a weos, you're just a, you're just uh, infant nursing. Look at verse twenty, verse twenty-five. Well, yeah, this I, I'll be back up, and read all this story. I get too much, too chasing too many rabbits. Verse twenty-five, same chapter, verse twenty-five. For this. Uh, But here, Agar, I'm using the King James. You probably have a translation that says Hagar. Mm -hmm. Do y'all say Hagar? Mm -hmm. Okay, King James says Agar, but it's referring to Hagar. You remember who Hagar was? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for this, Hagar is Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought she was a woman. <laughs> <laughs> he really messed up there. He yes. said she's a mountain. <laughs> she might be big as a mountain, but she ain't no mountain. I mean, we said that, had not slang talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. For this, mm -hmm. Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's the, what does he mean by that? Mm -hmm. He's talking about Hagar and the children of Hagar and the fact that that represents the physical body and how that the physical body is in bondage to Sinai or the, the law of sin, mm -hmm. sin, I -E, Sinai, the human body is in bondage to that. But yet Paul has said that you're not in bondage, you're an heir, but you're only in bondage as long as you're a child, as long as you're a nursing baby, mm -hmm. right? But even though you own it all, that's what Paul says in verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Even though you own it all, mm -hmm. you're still not you, you're not qualified to have it because you're suckling or you're a technon. That's the word for potty train. Mm -hmm. Agar, Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is from above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Yes. Okay, so if you notice, it says that they were in bondage with their children. Notice mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Well, that word children is a totally different word from the word child, and yet me and you look at it, and we begin to associate it, and we think it's the same word. It's the word technon, which means teenagers. They're in bondage. How many of you recognize and you realize teenagers are in bondage? They don't mean to be. That's just where they're at. It's in the process of growth. Mm -hmm. And so until they become a weos, so you see, these are words that you're not familiar with. You're not familiar with, with a technon or a potion or a weos. You're not familiar with these different terms, but yet these terms are used all through Scripture and they refer to the different places that you, the, a, an infant, or a toddler, uh, a teenager, and then a full-grown adult, 21-year-old. And you know, today they are trying to give six and seven and eight, nine, just little little babies medicine to try to make a boy a girl, et cetera, et cetera. It's the most dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I heard a brilliant doctor the other day talk about how stupid that doctor was that went before the Senate and they ask her, well, how many sexes are there? And she said, well, there possibly is five. <laughs> Jim George said, what? There was just only two when I was in school. 
<laughs> oh, there's five now. Wow. No, it wasn't Jim Jordan. It was uh, Kennedy from Louisiana. He and Sharp as tag. And he is humor, humorous at the same time. And he come back with the, just, just the brilliant answer to this so-called doctor to say it's five sexes. And, and so they had another lady that they interviewed who was also a doctor and told them all that that doctor, even though she had a degree, was dumber than a gourd. <laughs> Anybody knows that. I mean, come on, the whole world knows that. There are only two sexes, male and female. Even though you have a masculine and feminine brain, no matter whether you are a male or a female. Anyway, so if we're children here in bondage with, uh, with Hagar, that's referring to just your physical body. Every one of you are in bondage to your physical body until you, you tell your physical body that it's no longer in charge, that you'll, you'll take it from here on out, and you begin to tell it what it's going to do. And it will kick and scream and kick and scream, and it will seem like it will never, ever give up. And it won't. Because for it, it seems like a, a death sentence. However, how many of y'all ever tried to change? I said, and everybody said, yeah, they have. You have got the power to change if you're operating as an infant or a suckling baby or you're operating in your life as a teenager that still thinks you know everything and really don't know anything yet. You will not have the power to do it. You won't have the power to initiate the change until you begin to be a full adult, a spiritual adult, and you know that you know. And how does that happen? How, did, how would you ever get there? You me tell you how? It's not complicated. It's really simple. Knowledge. Knowledge is where power is at. Ignorance is where bondage is at. Most of us have been ignorant our whole life. I have so many areas of my life that I'm ignorant. I don't know. And you can do anything you want to me, to me, <laughs> if you want to, if I'm ignorant to it. You can manipulate me, you can con me, you can do all kinds of stuff to me if I'm ignorant to who I am. If I don't know who I am, where I fit in that wheel, what my power is and what my power is at, and the only way I will know that is through knowledge. And that's exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 3 and we didn't recognize it. And we've actually done like this. We've done taboo. I rebuke you, devil. We've done all this kind of crazy stuff to Genesis chapter 2. And when God said, here is your key to knowledge and this is where you will begin to take authority over all of the things that crop, crop up in your life. And if you don't have that key, you can't open that door. You can't go through that door. You can't take charge of your house. Somebody mm -hmm. else is in charge of your house. Mm -hmm. I.e. your body. Exactly. And that's mm -hmm. again it's, you come back to this fact that this is a this is a spiritual book about your spiritual authority. Exactly. And if we don't know that if we don't know the keys to this spiritual book, we don't know the keys to our spiritual authority, we cannot open the door. Mm -hmm. And you know today we uh and I, I didn't realize this till I guess a couple of years ago, or maybe not that long ago, that you can buy a front door handle that has a keypad on it. You don't have to have a key to open it up, but you do have to have the keypad. You have to know the keypad, just like Lincoln's have for years on many of the, the more expensive models had a keypad on the door. And all you have to do is punch that keypad in and it'll open the door for you. But if you don't know the number of that keypad, you can punch in numbers all day long. Mm -hmm. It's like if you're standing at your front door and you're punching all these numbers, it won't open. <laughs> Why won't it open? I keep punching numbers in, it just won't open. It's not the right number. You see, I say this over and over about the Hebrew alphabet. If you notice, it's not only an alphabet, it's a picture language because that's what it's about, pictures. That's what the, the astrological will is, pictures. 
and it's about numbers. It don't lie. Numbers don't lie. They don't lie. When your book, your checkbook says empty, mm -hmm. you better believe it's empty and don't write a check on it. Because numbers don't lie. This is a picture and numeric alphabet. And it, it's, it, once you start to read it, you start to know it, then all of a sudden you start to have the keys and punch in the right numbers. Voila, your door opens. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can stand there in front of it all day long or go get something and knock it down. That, that's what we were trying to do. We just run over it. I'm not knock it down. <laughs> all right, force it in, don't we? That's what we do with our military. That's why it's called armed forces. It's not of God. Really? Exactly. You see, God is all powerful. Power is moved by love. Force is moved by the strength of physical bodies. You get enough men together and you can force about anything you want. That's why we call it armed forces. That's why God's called power. God's all powerful. But we, okay, go with me to Hebrews. That's Hebrews chapter 1. Everybody that I know of, including myself, and I'm talking to me, preaching to me more than I'm preaching to you. So my words are mirrored back at me. Hebrews chapter 1, everybody wants to change. They want to change. They want certain changes in their life. Something. But you, until you have the power to accomplish that thing or that change that you want to come about, you're spinning your wheels. You're standing in front of a door and forgot your key. Mm -hmm. You can't unlock the door. Until you have the power to do it, to have the power to do it, you have to have the key to do it. When you have the key to do it, change is no problem. Why? Change anything you want. When you have the key. And many times the key to it is what God said. Well, I don't know what God said. God's not talking to me. Well, then you need to get quiet and listen to see what God's saying to you. Because God's talking. We, we looked at that last week. Psalms 19, the heavens declare. Kafar, they're talking every day, every moment, and it said there's not a language on the earth that it's not speaking to. Mm -hmm. Its voice is heard all over the whole world. It's just people don't, we, we don't hear it. We're not tuned into it. But we got to get tuned into it, right? Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. But unto the Son. Now, who is he talking about here when he uses the word Son, he's talking about adults. Is an adult the child of, of the parent? Yes, yeah, it is. But now that son has become an adult. Is it, it's a different word. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It is totally a different word. And when we start to recognize these different words and we begin to uh, tap into them, and we say, "Oh my goodness, this is this is powerful." All right. So he's talking to the son. Verse eight. Unto the Son, thy throne, O God, forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And a scepter, actually, you could say that's your key. That's what a scepter is. A key is a symbol. A scepter is a symbol of authority and rule. And that's what your key is. That's what your key represents. Authority and rule. The scepter of righteousness, the scepter of your kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above your fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. And they shall... Well, King James uses the word perish. Do y'all have a word up that perish there in verse 11? Perish is a bad word. It's not a good term for that for the original Greek word here. Did everybody's Bible got perish. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a shame that they all stuck with that. 
because you see, you have the idea that the earth will perish. The book of Ecclesiastes tells said, the book of Ecclesiastes says, the earth abides forever. Ever, mm -hmm. ever. Isaiah says exactly the same thing. The earth abides mm -hmm. forever and ever and ever. They ain't going to perish. Mm -hmm. But yet religion has taken, haven't they told you? Didn't religion tell you it's going to perish? God's going to burn it up. Didn't He say going to destroy the earth? Mm -hmm. And going to destroy it with fire? Did that what y'all always heard that? Mm -hmm. Not true. God ain't going to destroy it. God established the earth as an eternal entity just like it is. God is eternal and the earth is a part of the works of God's hand. It is eternal. Mm -hmm. But here this word actually should have been can ruin or spoil. That's spoiled. In other words, if you put meat in the, in the refrigerator and you keep it in there too long, what will it do? Mm -hmm. It's spoiled. It's, so you can say it's ruined. Mm -hmm. That would be it, the earth can spoil. Why? Because God's put you and me in charge of it. And I think we've allowed a lot of it to spoil. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but you remain. You remain. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. There it is. So what are we going to do? How many of you want the power of the change? The power of the of change is to get the key to the change. And if you get the key, then you have the power to change. And if you have the power to change, you can do the change that you want done, that, that's necessary. And that, that's totally up to you. And it's totally in your hands. Now I want you to go with me two places. The book of Revelations. And we'll close here. I mentioned this last week. And I wanted to uh, point it out. In the King James Bible, it's only in the King James Bible. It's not in any other translation. It's not in New American Standard, New English Version. Uh, it's not even in the New King James Translation. It's not in the Amplified. It's not in the Living Bible. It's not in the Message Bible. It's not in the Jerusalem Bible. It's not in any of the other translations other than the King James 1611, they use one Latin word, actually two, they use two Latin words in the English translation. They use the Latin word Lucifer and they use the Latin word Eusus. The word Lucifer is a Latin word that refers to the planet Venus. And actually the word means morning star or bringer of light used in Isaiah, okay? It's also used of Jesus. So Jesus was Lucifer. And I said that like I said, buddy, they done throw me out of church if I said, Jesus is Lucifer? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, he said, you are the Lucifer of the earth. You're the light of the earth. It's the same word. In Greek, it's the word phos. In Latin, it's the word lucifer. In Hebrew, it's the word helal. So you got three languages saying the same identical thing, but religion sold you a bill of goods off the lucifer story, and you bought that lucifer story, and you've been fighting lucifer, Satan, and the devil ever since, and that is, that is a religious lie that you and me are stuck in and don't know how to get free from it. Can't seem to get free from it. So I realized when I said that last week that Jesus was Lucifer. I thought, how would I back that up? I'm going to show you how to back it up. If you find Revelations chapter 22, and you can look this up in your own Bible. I don't care what translation you got. Revelations chapter 22 and look at verse 16. How many of you found it? Everybody there? Verse 16. And as a matter of fact, if you have a red letter edition, you'll see this is red letter. Which they say, say is what Jesus said. So, uh, <clears throat> Revelations chapter 22 verse 16 says, I, Jesus, 
have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root, and I am the offspring of David, and I am the bright, and you see that word morning star? Does your mm -hmm. translation say morning star? Yes. Yeah. If you look that word up in, in, uh, in the Greek or in the Latin, the word morning star is referring to the planet Venus, Lucifer. Because the morning star is the star planet that comes up before the sun and you can see it. You can, you can see it in the morning. If you just get up mm -hmm. uh, 30 minutes before the sun pops above the mountains or before you pops above the horizon, you get, you'll see that bright morning star coming up. I thought that meant Jesus. I'm sorry? I thought that meant Jesus. It does. Oh, okay. Jesus the is star. the bright morning star. Oh, okay. That's saying the same thing as saying Jesus is Lucifer because the bright morning star is Lucifer it's Venus, and you can see the Latin word uses the word Lucifer. The Hebrew uses the word Heal, and the Greek uses the word right here for this word, Phos, which is light, light bringer. And, that, and matter of fact, I think it's in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 6, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt. Same word, false. Greek word, false. So see, you have three different languages saying the same thing, and then they build a religion and a doctrine out of it and sold me and you the idea that Lucifer was the devil and Lucifer was Satan, and that's not true. I, I realize that's difficult. That's difficult to, to, guess, to get that, but... You see, that light, that light, you have to go with me to John's Gospel. Just one other passage, we'll go over there. John's Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Chapter 1. first four verses and I'm going to change a word that's not right. It's wrong. It should not be there. And then you'll, I'll explain it to you. In the beginning, that word beginning in Greek uh, is actually referring to first principles. It's the Greek word arche. Arche. And it has to do with the arch where the sun rises first in the arch. That's the first principle. In other words, it's the first thing that, that you teach a child. If a child that's an infant, this, well, it's the first principle that you teach them. What is the first thing that you teach them to do? <coughs> the first thing you teach them to do is speak. They can't talk. Mm -hmm. You ever notice that? Mm -hmm. The baby can't talk. Mm -hmm. They go. They go. <laughs> And cannot talk. And usually it takes how long to teach them? Because you really work desperately at it. Because you work, you get out and say, say mama, say mama, 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 mama. You say, watch my little mama. <laughs> how long does it take you to teach them to say that? A year or two. It takes a while. Some of them start a little earlier than others. Right? Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Or I taught my grandkids first thing to say, Papa. <laughs> Oh, but the first thing that you teach, the first principle, now this is not complicated if you can kind of get the fact that they messed it up with translation. The first principle that you teach is word. You teach them the word. You teach them a word. Mm -hmm. And in that case, a mama or daddy or papa or whatever. Look at what this says right here. That word, you can look this up. It's a word beginning, don't mean start and place. It actually is arcane. It's principles. First principle. What does he say? The first principle is the word. Logos. T 
Teach them the word. Teach them to speak. So if they're little, if they're little Spanish babies, they I don't know how they say it's mama in Spanish. Mamacita. Oh, Mamacita. Oh, yeah. Mamacita. But that's what they teach. If they're, if they're English speaking, we say mom or mother. Proper mother, say mother. <laughs> Most of them get mom. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing you do. First principle. That's what they say. First principle. Talk about first principle. First principle is the word, and the word is with God, and the word is God. So they're teaching them that the very principle of their words are like God. You never were taught that principle, were you? Mm -hmm. If you was taught that principle that your word is like God, you would you would understand the Proverbs very clearly. It says you are snared. Mm -hmm. that, that just simply means you're put in a cage by the words of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Jesus said it this way: life and death is in the power of the tongue. Mm -hmm. Jesus said it this way: you eat the fruit of your life by your words. Okay. I don't speak your words. You don't speak my words. I live by my words, you live by your words. Mm -hmm. Word is the first principle that you ever learn. And if we were taught correctly, we would realize words are powerful. Right. Words are keys. Words mm -hmm. open doors, words shut, shut doors. I used to tell couples when I used to do a lot of counseling. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of counseling. I, I, I finally said, I ain't doing that no more. I wouldn't yeah. do it. Amen. I did a lot of counseling <laughs> over the years, and I would tell, you know, I would tell couples different things that would happen to them. I said, you know, you can beat her and that, that hurts and people see that. Mm -hmm. But your words cut her deep and they'll go to the core of her being and sometimes you can't take that back. Mm -hmm. When you speak it, you let it go and it, it cuts deep. Mm -hmm. Words cut deep. Mm -hmm. Words are keys that have life and death in them. Scripture mm -hmm. is filled with that. Your word is powerful. Your word is the Logos. It's, that's, that's, your word is the key that will open that door. They got doors now that you can punch. They're going to have doors eventually that all you've got to do is say something and it'll respond to your word. Mm -hmm. Got computers like that. Mm -hmm. People talk to them. Word. Now look at this, verse 1. And I'm changing the word that I'm changing is was. God never was. God always is. God never was. God always is. God wasn't. If you have a God that was back yonder in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and you have a God today that's different from that God back there in the Old Testament, I'm not sure where that God is or where you got it. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, He probably ain't working too good for you. <laughs> because God is. God always was, God is, and God will always be. Yes. There's not a time ever that God didn't exist. Mm -hmm. God exists from the past, the present, the future. He encompasses it all because it is it all. God is all. So if you read this as God was, then you have a past tense God, and, that, and a past tense God can't help you anytime in the present tense. Amen, Brother Lynn. Amen. So I change that word was to is, and I do it like this. And the first principle is the word. Mm -hmm. And the Word is with God, and the Word is God. The same is the principle with God. Mm -hmm. Verse 3. All things are made by the Word, and without the Word was not anything made that is made. Mm -hmm. In Him is life. Not was. You, you hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to make this present tense now. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's always in the now. God is in the now. You've got to keep God in the present moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, see, in this very moment right now, I'm giving you the key to the power to change whatever you want to change. In Him is life, and that life is what? The light, the false, same identical word. The light. The light of men. And verse 5, it says, The light shines into the darkness, or matter. Darkness mm -hmm. is referring to matter. And the matter of the darkness comprehends it not. That word comprehends catalabano in the Greek actually means you can't stop what the words do it. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's great. You can't stop it. That's it's great. going to do it because it's the word. Yes. Because it's an eternal principle. And that eternal principle is mm -hmm. the key for every one of us. 
If you have something in your life that you'd like to change or you want to do, get the Word on it. Get the first principle on it. When you get that, use that Word as a key and just stand on it. Just keep going with it. Stand on it. And it will, it will work for you. That's right. Amen. I quit. I'll stop right there.